Welcome to this important event, the first PhD event at Spell Tech, and uh, it's a great day. I would uh, first like to introduce the members of the jury, and uh, after that, the candidate, of course, and uh, then we start with the presentation, which is going to last 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have an hour of questions, maybe more, all right? And then I'll ask the jury to go to the next room, one of the pre crop rooms, and some of our guests, and the supervisor, and some other staff, and then we'll have deliberation. You're welcome to stay here. It should take about 30 minutes for us to talk and prepare things. And then we'll come back here to see the candidate and say hello and the things. And then we should go to the third floor. So, let's start. So my name is uh, Professor Clément Fortin. I'm uh, Sophia Pro and Dean of Faculty and Postdoctoral Affairs at the uh, Econ Research in the area of PLM and Product Development and System Engineering. And uh, we also have on the jury Professor Ed Crawley, who cannot make it here. Maybe he's going to call in, maybe not. We'll see. But we have also Professor Einstower from uh, Germany and the Netherlands, or many places, Japan, and uh, has, has a very distinguished career uh, with degrees in uh, technical physics, economics, and system management has been involved with ESA, System Engineering and Programmatic Department, is a founder for System Studies and System Integration in Space Systems, and he's the Board of Governors of uh, Research Organization, he's been in Japan, a distinguished researcher at, uh, at um, scientists at NASA GPL, so a lot of experience in System Engineering, and past presidents of the International Association of System Engineering and a past member of the board at DLR. Welcome. And the emeritus professor at the U Delft also, and Japan and Singapore. We have uh, Professor Olivier Devec from uh, MIT, Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics and Engineering Systems at MIT, research interest in system engineering with emphasis on life cycle properties, the what's called the ELTs, product platforms and manufacturing, space systems, space logistics and habitation, integrated modeling and simulation, and multidisciplinary design and optimization. And he's uh, editor-in-chief of System Engineering, the most uh, known uh, journal in this field, and he's senior vice president and head of technology planning and road mapping at Airbus for a little while. Thank you very much for being here. We have a provost. Professor Rupert Gertzer, who's a medical doctor and researcher, has been the director of the ELR, uh, what, what the name of it, I have to, the Institute of Aerospace Medicine, and uh, he's been more than 20 years there in Cologne, and uh, which is the Western Europe largest civil institute in aerospace medicine, published a significant amount of papers and he's co-founder of a commercial company and he's been with us for almost two years now. And then we have Professor Jeff Boutique, assistant professor, earned his PhD in engineering management from the University of Novi Sad in Serbia, he holds a master in entrepreneurship from the University of Nottingham and a master in electrical and computer engineering also. His current research work is in the field of knowledge, innovation interface, patent valuation, and patent data analysis. And uh, he's been uh, working, and that's working very closely with students in startups and teaching a, a famous course now at Spotek called I2I, Ideas to Impact. We have also Professor Alessandro Volcar, which I'd like, of course, He's the supervisor, the advisor of the candidate, uh, professor in uh, system engineering. Uh, it's uh, was the interim pre director for space. It's been it's got take longer than me, and uh, it's great. I think it's quite fitting. That's what we're saying with 
And at the end of the Dean of Education, it's quite fitting that Alessandro was the first thesis because I think he was one of the first professors at Scotland. <laughs> Received a PhD at Aeronautics and Astronautics from MIT in 2012. And uh, he's the director of the Strategic Innovation Research Group at Scott Tech, authored a number of publications, he's a member of ICOSI, and a number of other recognition. Uh, so he's been very, very active, and he's now the Vice President of Concurrent Engineering, Technology Planning, and Rule Mapping in the Chief Technology Office at Airbus. So, welcome back, Alessandro, but he almost never left it. Uh, and then we have guests from uh, Subeho, Sarah uh, Subeho, who are with us. And we're very, very happy. Professor Alain Gate, Professor of Industrial Engineering in Aeronautics and at the Space, at the Aeronautics and Space Institute. He's a Subeho Toulouse, in charge of engineering, industrial engineering section. His research interests are planning and scheduling models for project and production management, taking into account resources of workforce and energy. And Professor Rob Fingerholt, also from, he's a Subero aerospace engineer from Delft University, PhD in Applied Sciences from the University of Ghent in Belgium, and he's working now in research medical, mathematical modeling of dynamic systems, real time systems, formal methods of, for time correctness of systems, and so on, system engineering. So, I think we have a pretty good jury. Now, our candidate. So, Ignacy has been with us for a few years. He's a researcher in distributed space systems in the Strategic Innovation Research Group from, with Alessandro from the beginning almost. You were one of the early founders of Skoltech as a student. Uh, you received in 2011 the degree in aerospace engineering from the Universidad Politecnica de Catalonia in Barcelona, BC. <coughs> and he developed his master thesis on novel satellite navigation systems. Afterwards, he joined the European Space Agency at this tech for a while, worked on Galileo navigation system, and arrived at Skoltech in 2013. You know, I thought you would have memorized all of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I didn't memorize it, unfortunately. 2013, he joined Scottech PhD program, uh, and he spent four months as a visiting researcher at MIT. He's uh, been very, very active in the Space Center, and I've seen that since I've been here. He's been involved in the IL Blue Balloon Lean campaign for demonstration, and he worked hard on his PhD thesis, and he's going to present that to us this morning. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's us welcome the jury and our candidate this morning. Thank you very much. Observation. 
So you know, our Earth observation was enabling our uh, cartography, our geodesy, our high measure resolution, uh, altimetry, weather. And as the instruments we put in space improve, and we're having more and more data. Just yesterday I read in Space News that we are generating every day in space about 10 times the US uh, Congress library in data. And this has to be done linked. And in lower orbit, we are at about uh, 500 to 800 kilometers altitude. And what's happening is each satellite is in ground station for just 10% of the time. So basically, what you can see here, the satellite can only the data when it's on the coverage of the ground station. And then for the rest of the orbit, it's just accumulating data with uh, no chance to unlink it. But if you have another satellite which can relate for this first satellite, what you're effectively having is you're increasing the access time on the time this first satellite can downlink its data. That's just a straightforward example of how federated satellite systems can improve this uh, downlink bottleneck. Of course, the immediate question is what type of interfaces, how can these satellites uh, cooperate, how can these satellites exchange this data? So obviously they need some kind of inter-satellite link technologies, radio or optical, just to be some mature technology, but then they also will ask themselves, is it worth it to deploy these interfaces? There's a benefit cost rate there, which is one of the things we want to assess here. So now let's generalize a bit more. Um, in here you have to lay down conceptually what this thesis is doing. So we started with our motivation, which is specifically architecting and analyzing the traits in federated satellite systems. And then what we're doing is we're generalizing the problem to a class of systems called Federation of Systems. And there's two issues we're facing there. First, there's a lack of architecting frameworks. In general, the systems of systems field has some frameworks, but most of them are not quantitative. We have a very long review on system of systems uh, on the thesis. And there's not so many frameworks that would help us there. And then also we have two specific research questions which I will introduce that will guide our efforts. And to answer this, we have an approach which is developing an integrated framework for our case, and most importantly, we are using a conceptual artifact, which is synergy, which is this idea of the mutual benefit of cooperating between satellites in space or any other systems. And synergy is something, it's an idea that has been used and exists in a lot of literature, especially in economy, but in engineering systems we haven't seen much of this terminology and usage of this mutual benefit of cooperation. So this is uh, a conceptual construct we're using, and with this, armed with this framework, we are drilling down to specific solutions in three different case studies, which I will introduce. So let's define a bit in more general words what a federation of systems is. So the definition proposed by this work is a set of engineering systems with independent goals, management, and operations that possess the adequate interface to cooperate, and they do so when it's advantageous for all the parties involved. So, the first part of the definition, this engineering system with independent goals, management, and operations, this is basically the general definition of systems of systems, which was proposed first by Meyer in 1998. So we recognize federations are a type of system of systems, and we're just adding two key elements to our definition. First element is the interfaces, which are important because they introduce this benefit cost rate, so is it worth it to deploy the interfaces? And the second element we introduce in the theory and uh, definition is this concept of advantage. So it has to be advantage locally for all the systems present, and I will elaborate more on this. Now going to a bit more practical question of when engineering systems are cooperating in the frame of a federation, what do you mean by this? What type of cooperation can happen in between engineering systems? Well, we can just use the types of operands that systems use. Uh, those are def were defined by Crowley in 2016. So, to fulfill that goal, systems can be either operating on data, on data information, which is actually on data content, which is actually information. They can be exchanging energy or matter. And then you can envision, especially, data and data content exchanges between systems. Nowadays, uh, we all uh, are working with the Internet of Things, with machine-to-machine -machine systems. There's a lot of networking protocols out there, so exchanging data in this digitalized world we live in is quite straightforward with the current technological forms. 
So FSS is a case of cooperation based on a data operand, and then information <laughs> exchange, for instance, to increase your, improve your operation, something that's happening in vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle networks. This is a concept proposed uh, to exchange data in between different cars, autonomous cars maybe, so that they can coordinate the distances on the road, understand if a car is braking in front of them, and basically optimize the road operations of cars by exchanging this information. That would be an example of a federation. And then there's other, a bit more exotic cooperation operands that you could use, like energy. We could be talking about the <coughs> to grid paradigm as some kind of mutual benefit exchange of energy. And then you could also exchange matter, but actually we can challenge ourselves to find any system, that, set of systems that would keep operational independency and exchange matter. That's a bit more exotic. So today we're focusing on the first part of the table on data-based cooperation. So, just to have a quick snapshot of what's the role of federations in the literature. So, uh, again here I'll mostly use the work of Meyer, but many other uh, authors, and there's a lot of very extensive review in the thesis, but basically Meyer defined or separated systems of systems into three different classes, and in here we see very clearly how Federations of systems are actually a virtual system of systems the way Maya defined them. And the key aspects here are the voluntary, voluntary aspect and the fact that there's no global stakeholders. So the way we have been working with federations of systems and the way we have been practicing this topic, basically there has to be a mutual benefit for the systems to engage. They have to see a benefit on their own local trade space. There is no global stakeholder with authority in its curious form, with authority or coercive power to make the systems collaborate. In directed system of systems like military integrated defense air wars, there's always a hierarchy which can force the systems to cooperate for a higher goal. In federations, we're talking there's no higher goal. The systems collaborate because they see a benefit for themselves in the collaboration. And this aspect is very important and we need to capture it uh, with the framework. So, now what types of questions architecting and designing the system's poses. So, uh, first of all, I, I like to distinguish here a static problem and a dynamic problem. So, on the static side, first we need to understand how federation of, a federation of systems configuration, that is an embodiment of different systems in the federation, a particular set of architectures of all the composing systems, how this particular snapshot does yield any benefit for the participant systems. So, just throw at us any federation with a set of defined architectures for every system. We need to understand if this is mutually beneficial, if they would engage in cooperation. That's the static aspect of the framework. And that's this benefit cost rate for every single system and to understand if they would voluntarily cooperate. That's the first thing we said. And the second is also very important, which is the dynamic aspect of federation. So, federations pose, as many other human systems, a network externalities effect. If you're the first satellite or any system to include this interface and to be able to cooperate, if you're the first person having a telephone, and this is an example we use many times, you are the first person having a telephone, but nobody else has a telephone, there's no much you can do. So, for the first system, there's a very complicated network externality effect, and you have to be able to see how the federation will emerge and evolve to be able to understand through the life cycle of the system if you're going to have returns. So this also is going to be an uh, answer for the framework. We, these two static and dynamic aspects have been organized into different research questions. First, this idea of how can we measure synergy, and synergy, the quantitative measurement of synergy will be what gives us this idea of systems are good of cooperating or not. And then we want to predict the formation and evolution of federations of engineering systems for the system to understand if this network externality effect would be overcome. So in here I have an example. So you'll see through this presentation we're working a lot with utility cost rate spaces. So in here utility just captures any type of stakeholder value response or a performance that the stakeholder is uh, looking for. We can use multi-attribute utility theory or any other way to capture these axes, and then we have a cost. So imagine there's first system being designed, 
and the first architect, he or she, has five options, those are the red dots. So this first architect can basically choose different, five different system embodiments, five different designs or architectures for the system, such that different utility and cost uh, coordinates are found through running a model. So imagine that this uh, architect will choose the first point, and the system is designed and commissioned on this utility cost coordinate. And then a second system comes. Same thing here, there's a series of architectural options. And then the second architect chooses another point for her or his own system. And now these two systems engage in cooperation. What can happen is you can have a feedback. The actual operation point in utility and cost of the system one could change. So this feedback, you have to be capturing it and you have to be understanding what's going to happen from the perspective of the first system and any other. So now we're going to move into the approach. So how do we answer these questions? So again, let's start by the static aspect of the framework. How do we compute synergy uh, between a set of two systems or n systems? So this is a bit of a dense slide, so uh, bear with me. So again, imagine you have two systems, <coughs> system one, system two, and uh, through a full factorial trace space exploration or any other method, they are able to draw a parity from of their architectural options on their own before any type of cooperation. So for, for the ones not initiated, this parity of run here is giving you the best compromise on system utility and cost that this architect is able to find through modeling, through designing uh, his or her system. So these two systems have these two best compromises and then they cooperate, right? The systems are commissioned and then they start cooperating. So imagine system one experiences a utility cost coordinate alpha, right? So through cooperation, there is some kind of utility and cost achieved different of what was uh, achievable on the own means of system one. And system two experiences a coordinate beta. So the question is, for system one, it's clearly optimal. It's dominating its own options when it's not cooperating, but for system two, this solution is suboptimal. So, would they cooperate if one is happy about it and the other is not? And that is the key question. So, what we're see seeing here is that if the cost advantage incurred by the system one is larger than the cost expenses incurred by system two, this is not a sufficient, but it's a necessary condition for this to happen. That is, if the benefits experienced by system one can offset the expenses incurred by system two and there's still a slack, and the bigger the slack is the better, you can say there is the technical conditions for the emergence of this federation, and, and here we have a very short way to introduce synergy. Synergy would just be the sum of these two cost differentials. So basically, you're comparing here how much I'm spending when I'm cooperating against how much would I have spent to achieve this utility of my own. And this differential is how much better is the cooperation for me, and this could cover the cost other people are incurring. So, in this particular case, when you have two systems and they're in alpha and beta like configurations, we call it weak synergy. Why? Because this system needs to be convinced, it needs to be paid incentives, probably. Yes? If system two would be experiencing also a dominating solution like gamma, if system two is at gamma, then basically we call it strong synergy, because they cooperate and both of them see locally uh, utility benefit and cost larger than they what can achieve on their own. So now we have a bit of um, formulation. This, this is a very long and uh, rigorous formulation on the of all this, but in here I just wanted to give the fundamental snapshot. So I'm using a term that is the net benefit of cooperation. And this is defined for each system. And here you have exactly what I showed before. So first what you're doing is you're transforming the utility you achieve in cooperation. To this function f, you transform it to a cost coordinate. So what you're doing, you're just reading the utility on point alpha and you're seeing how much cost it would have cost you through your standard on Pareto front. This f function is a Pareto front. So Usually it's defined in a piecewise linear fashion. If it's uh, 3D, it's going to be a surface. It needs to be uh, bijective and invertible, and the Pareto front 
uh, Fortuna Beatis, and then you subtract the cost of cooperation, and then there's this aspect of the incentives that are exchanged. So as we said, it might be the case on which systems have to incentivize each other for cooperation to happen, but not that I'll define synergy as the sum of the net benefit, uh, benefits of cooperation for all the systems. So this is exactly the quantification of synergy. When you add all the benefits of cooperation of all the systems present, you actually cancel out all the exchanges of incentives. It's a zero sum. So you cancel out all the exchanges of incentives between the systems. So when you are assessing synergy of a configuration, you don't need to understand the incentive scheme, which is important for us because it puts on hold a problem that we could have. So we can see how good a configuration is without having to enter on the particulars of incentive exchange. And I will also be using this expression, the distributed and integrated synergy, which is just uh, the synergy system is experienced through different lifetimes, through different federation configurations with a discount factor, considering that future returns are less appealing than short-term returns, and also divided by the amount of systems present. When you divide the synergy by the amount of systems present, you're basically having an estimator of the net benefit of cooperation for each system. I will also be showing returns on investment, which is just the synergy as it is a net benefit, divided by the interface cost. So, to make a... Uh, this is one of the key aspects that we get more questions so to get just an example of what is this synergy. So, you can imagine this is an example I, I used also in the previous uh, meeting, but I think not everybody is aware of it. So, imagine Professor Stower buys a ticket for the opera and he spends, I don't know, $40. And then he has something coming up so he cannot go to the opera that day. So, basically, Professor Stower just lost $40 somehow. And then comes Professor De Beck and suddenly realizes there's this awesome opera happening on Sunday, and he wants to buy a ticket, but it's too late. So he can only buy tickets on the second-hand market, and he finds a, let's say, an $80 ticket. So the best professor that they can do to go to the opera is to pay $80. And Professor uh, Stower just lost $40 in a ticket that he cannot use. So what they can do, for instance, they can exchange the ticket at $60. So I give you 20 <laughs> <laughs> And they can negotiate the incentives. But since the best that they can do is a $100 ticket, and for him, every recovery of $40 or more would be positive, there is a synergy state between them, right? And then they can negotiate the incentives in any scheme they want. That goes for the static aspect. Then the dynamic aspect, how we assess these different configurations through lifetime. In here, we're using Markov decision process. So in here, each state, S1, S1, 2, S1, 3, is representing a different configuration of the federation with all the different architectures. And in here we're carrying a vector with the architectural definition of all the systems present. So fundamentally we're respecting the Markov property because we are carrying on all the information we have. And at each step, there's a new architect coming and is making a decision on what architecture, on what to, how to design its or her own system. So basically, as the federation is expanded and more potential systems join. You see this tree is exponentially growing, so you have three options here, here you're going to have three by three, on the next step you would have three by three by three. So this uh, grows very quickly, so the way to navigate this tree, we're using uh, a subset of uh, MDP policies, either we use greedy in some cases, I have explored the full tree and I have found in some specific cases the global optimum, and we can talk about it uh, actually later if, if you are curious on how, to, how we navigate this tree. And at each stage, as we said, we can measure synergy as we have explained. So we have a federation configuration and we can measure synergy. So we can actually find the most synergetic configurations and this is good for all the systems present, right? Because it's the uh, sum of all the net benefits of cooperation. So you can basically find what configuration paths will yield the most returns for the federation. Just an overview of how the framework works. First step, you just need to um, characterize all the local trade spaces of the systems, their local utility and cost functions. That's all like conventional trade space exploration, nothing new happening there. And then you do what we just explained. You evaluate these configurations. You expand one step the tree. 
you choose to what steps to go based on an algorithm, or you just explore them all, and you do this again. Quick note, when you're computing the synergy on step 2.1, you might need to have an optimization assignment because you're doing a resource allocation between systems, so you have to find what's the optimal resource allocation at every step to be able to compare optimal steps to optimal steps. So, since you might have an optimization assignment at every step, exploring the full tree also gets computationally complex, and we can explain how we deal with that. So let's start with the first case study. How will we doing this time? Okay, you're still not sleeping, good. So this is the main motivation of the work for related satellite systems, and let's see very briefly how we apply the framework there. So in this case, we study a low Earth orbit Earth observation constellation, and we're going to be trading its only its communications architecture. That's the only thing that actually interplays with, with the idea of FSS. So assume you have a, you're designing an uh, Earth observation satellite, and for the communications architecture, you have six ground segment options, which uh, they include uh, leasing, they include building your own ground stations, and then you have five options for the space to ground data rate, so to put a more powerful uh, downlink capabilities or less powerful, then you have three geostationary relay options. If to use a geostationary relay, like TRS, uh, there's one option for not using, one option for using it at a low level rate, and uh, an option to use the high performance services of TRS. And with these six, five, and three options, you can basically make uh, a trace based exploration of this communications architecture of the mission, and then you can find the standalone Pareto flow, what the mission can do on its own. And since I showed you all examples in 2D, let's jump on 3D now. So in here, we're going to be uh, working with the bandwidth, which is actually how much data volume this mission is downlinking per orbit with the latency. So how much time between the data generated and reaches the ground, and then the cost of these different communication architectures. So what we're doing here is we're basically testing how uh, these different architectures give different downlink capability and latency for different cost of these missions. And this surface here, this surface adjustment, is the best trade, again, that the system can be used on. And then what we will do is give these options plus the two federation options to the system and see how these new latency and bandwidth points uh, connect to this trade space and what's the cost advantage of doing this. So, and then what we're doing is basically finding on three what every next architect would do up to five systems. So how does this look like? So this is the returns of investment for this uh, five satellite case finding uh, the optimal paths and there's a there's a side note here we can talk about what optimal means. So here we're talking about how the first satellite sees it. So this first satellite is going to include an interface and hope the next architects will see a benefit and also join an interface. Now again, the fact that synergy is positive, it doesn't mean that it's sufficient. We understand there might be a contract there, there might be negotiation, so there might be a lot of things happening before systems actually engage. But this is the necessary technical and economical conditions for this to happen. So first here, what you have on the left is the returns of investment for the first system traded against the life cycle cost of including this interface, this inter-satellite link and this onboard data handling. Since we might not know exactly what this hardware is going to cost, we just try different options from 1 to 24 million. So how you read this is if this hardware is going to cost 10 million, you're going to have approximately a 2.5 return of investment. You're going to have 25 million on cost advantages in respect to having the same performance when you're on your own. Yes? That's exactly how this reads. <coughs> so what we saw here on the left on the blue plot is that systems, when they are constrained, they tend to go for the highest utility area of the uh, trade space. That's where the highest gains in synergy are. Why? And this is an interesting uh, outcome. Because when you're at this extra mile, when every single bit of extra utility costs a lot more to the system, and this is a stalling on utility which we see many physical systems, for the cost, uh, for the system on its own, it costs a lot to achieve every extra mile there. But if the federation can apply you a shift there, right, 
the gains you have in that region are much larger. So, in a simplified manner, what this means is the more you, expe you spend on this infrastructure, the more you're going to get of sharing uh, these capabilities and amortizing. If you are constrained, and then to explore other parts of the testers, we constrain the architects and watch how much they can spend on the communications architecture to 80, 14, 20, and you see you have proportional reduction of return of investment. Obviously, if the FSS hardware costs 20 million and you can only spend 20 million and then you have no other communication capabilities, this is not going to give you any return of investment, right? And this gives you the best path. And by the way, in the tree, there is thousands of paths that go, that go to negative synergy, right? So this is just the best option for the systems present. And then we run many, many, many sensitivity analysis. And you have a very quick uh, snapshot of the takeaways from each. So, well, first we try to navigate this tree with the different options. Then also we try different discount rates. So in the nominal case, I'm showing a 20% discount rate. So every year, the value of this return of investment is reduced by 20%. So of course, if you increase this discount rate and you make the architects very short-sighted, they will not go for federation. And also, there's a, uh, another constraint, which is called the sharing constraint, so which tells you how much are the uh, systems willing to trade. If you reduce how much are the systems, if they want to reserve a lot of capability on their own, of course, the optimal synergy is reduced because you cannot reallocate fully all the resources. You have some slack for each system, so this is also quite obvious result. Important, it had many different utility functions using uh, these wise linear functions, using plateaus, and the takeaway with the response of the stakeholder to performance is fundamentally, if there is one or several systems that have a, an appeal, right, a hunger for more performance, you're going to find positive synergy. Of course, if there's very large plateaus or even negative response to performance, this is not going to work. And also, interestingly, right, one uh, running of the tree with 10 systems, which is computationally intensive, to see how adding more systems and actually in different, different orbital parameters look like. And uh, there's interesting insights to be had here. So in here what you have is a deployment of 1 to 10 satellites, and you see the distributed synergy. So the synergy of the state divided by the number of systems present. So you see the first system is using, it's just investing 10 million on its interface and nothing is happening and then as you're adding systems you increase the synergy this is divided by the number of systems present so if we plot the absolute synergy it would be actually increasing at much faster pace but interestingly something happens with system 5 so when you add system 5 to the federation the configuration is still synergetic so as a snapshot it's important to, it's uh, interesting to do it but Taking into account from which synergy you came, system 5 reduces a bit the available synergy. This is happening because of network topology constraints, and this is a very important takeaway for federations. If you have no visibility or you have network connection problems to other federates, of course you cannot trade anything. And what's happening here is that system 5 is making an expense that cannot be amortized. So the overall synergy resents. But also more interestingly, examining the network topology of this case, you see system 5 actually bridges the federation to system 6, and again, more synergy is achieved. Why? Because taking into account the geometry, the existing of system 5 allows to relay to system 6 and to system 7. So, this is an interesting governance problem for federations. So, would these first four systems agree to have the fifth system? Would they be long-sighted enough? to understand that adding the fifth system would lead us to a higher synergy later. And this is a similar thing which is happening for system 7 or system 9. So some network topology positions are better than others, will bring you more synergy than others. So this is an interesting problem for governance that we're also discussing at the end of the thesis. Now, second case study, which is red sourcing. And this will be, I promise, more familiar to everyone. So we all just Uber or sometimes get or leave this right sourcing services, that's how I uh, propose to call it technically rather than right sharing. So what we're doing here is, is a, a case study basically inspired by the sharing economy because 
that the data satellite system are also somehow inspired by the sharing economy. There is differences, but there's also similarities. So we stress testing the framework to run a case with uh, red sourcing. And basically what we're doing here is we're considering the riders and the drivers, the people who use the car and the people who drive it as a federation, right? Of people that has to be particular benefit, has to see their own benefit to join this system. So what we're doing here, this is not a like conceptual case, this is actually using uh, a lot of market data from Uber in New York since, uh, since 2012, where they had a beta service until 2017. So actually, we're, this framework run takes five years and it ends up exactly in September 17. So what we're doing here is we're playing the Uber executive in New York. So you can decide how much you want to charge the users and how much you want to pay the drivers. And with this difference, you have to make your own money and keep the riders happy and keep the drivers happy. And try this to, in a harmonic way, develop this federation without breaking it. Because if you make the, usually the riders too happy, you're not paying enough to the drivers, and then there's no drivers. If you pay too much to the drivers and you charge too much to the users, then there's gonna be no users. If you pay a lot to both of them, then your platform, Uber, is gonna be making losses. And by the way, Uber is making huge expansion losses worldwide. So you play this game of developing this federation, and there's an important difference here. There's a, a coordination platform which has centralized authority on the transactions, which is not what we were seeing or proposing for satellite systems. There's a, this is the state model to understand the synergy in each case, and it's basically using a, a conventional economic theory to understand the supply, the demand, and the net benefit of cooperation for the driver. So how much the driver makes respect to a conventional taxi service, and the benefit for the rider, how much the rider saves respect to a conventional taxi service, also waiting in the waiting time difference. And then you check the level of service, too, because sometimes there's game over scenarios when there's not enough cars, so nobody can be served. Or uh, when there's no users, so the drivers are not making money, so they decide to not go out for the day. So basically here we just ran the framework for five years and checked with the specific uh, reward strategy to try to keep this alive and making decisions every month on the pricing. And after five years, the results on market parameters are remarkably similar to what we find in real New York Uber data. So you have here the validation uh, discussion. So for the rider, for the driver earnings, for the commission the platform is taking, for the waiting time, even some people have approximations of how much Uber made in New York in 16, and we remarkably match it. So it's quite comforting, these results. Also, the number of drivers is remarkably close to what Uber got after five years. The, big, the, the biggest difference here, and what we cannot predict properly, is the number of riders, which is much more volatile. So what's happening with the riders? In our macroeconomic model, we're not taking into account retaliation from conventional taxi market, which has done a lot of modernization, competitive pressure of get, competitive pressure of lift. Uh, we're not taking into account the user perception of Uber as a brand. And all this, you should factor all this in if you want to really have a good estimation of the, of the riders. So in this part, obviously, we don't have a detailed model that could represent this properly, but all the rest of parameters are uh, pretty much uh, giving us a very good uh, relation with actual real market data. Now the last case study, which uh, is much more similar to satellite federations, which is wireless community networks. What is this? This is peer-to-peer -peer networks that people use in uh, rural areas to give internet uh, to their neighbors and to extend the internet coverage when deploying fixed infrastructure is very expensive. So actually wireless community networks are very popular in, in Catalonia, my home region. And what people do is they organize themselves as a community effort and from a village which has some kind of internet high-speed access point, they just start off spreading usually WiMAX uh, links. And in here, what we're gonna be simulating is this expansion of this, of this uh, network, and if it makes sense compared to conventional uh, fixed infrastructure, and compared with satellite internet options. And here, the architect is every household, every peer that decides if to uh, add uh, him or herself to the system, or to go for other options like satellite internet for different performances. 
to simulate. And here we're playing with different parameters. We're playing with the household density. We're playing with the capacity of the Wi-Max edges. We're playing with how the network looks like. So to simulate this, we use uh, Gaussian Newman structures. We just have a randomized allocation of different households in this map. So we have to Monte Carlo this to get insights. And then we basically compare all these options and each peer. And here we just uh, uh, group them by levels. So each peer at one edge from the source, two edges from the source, three edges from the source, will decide if joining the, the system is advantageous with respect to all the other options. So what you see here is the distributed synergy, so how much the bill is saving with respect to internet, satellite internet, or respects to deploying a ground infrastructure paid by the community. And you see, up to the third uh, deployment level, it is good, it is positive to be uh, uh, expanding this peer network. And then what's happening here is also an interesting effect which they call tragedy of the commons in, in wireless community networks and it's also well known. In here you're just adding peers, more and more peers with no more connection to the access point. They just relay in three, five, six level relays. And basically the Wi-Max edges, we made test space, we made sensitivity assessments to very different Wi-Max edge capacity, but even the best Wi-Max uh, routers have at most, most, most 450 megabit seconds. So at some point, the peers are experiencing a capability much, much, much less than they could do with satellite internet or, or fiber. And the question is, is there a point with these breaks? Is there a parameter space on household density, Wi-Max, uh, <coughs> Wi-Max uh, capabilities per edge? where this breaks, and it does. And actually, there's a specific discussion on, the, uh, on this case study where we found the parameter space on which this actually uh, breaks down. So this leads us to think, obviously, there are situations on which peers are being uh, added to the federation, and they do not give value. They just use resources, and this is a case of tragic comments, and this is a potential demise for the federation. So we're going to go into Conclusions, and I see everyone is relieved. So we illustrated oh, no. <laughs> we illustrated the emergence and evolution of three federations. Two of them exist: wireless community networks and right sourcing markets. Satellite system federations do not exist nowadays, but we also illustrated their their economies. How from the very start this is possible to have a, a beneficial federation. Either, even in some cases, you might need initial negative synergy states. So there's a transition period in which you're deploying the system and there's more cost and benefits. How, how do you offset this? How do you go over this value of death? There is two options. In satellite systems, you, we see early adopters can see later in the trade space an advantage. So if you can capture the returns of federation at some point of life cycle that is reasonable for the architect, uh, you will be able to reason for federation. In cases like right sourcing, you need an external incentives, you need an external authority to provide these incentives, because it didn't show it, but in right sourcing you need about, in New York, about 10,000 riders and 4,000 drivers before the system is beneficial to everybody, and before there's benefits for the platform. You cannot convince 4,000 people to make expenses for several months just to build a right sourcing system. So you need this external authority and decentralized uh, governance system. Some, sometimes people ask me, this is all very well, but what's the origin of this benefit? What's the origin of this value? Why there is uh, more than a zero-sum game? And there's two mechanisms that enter in play here. First, classic systems engineering functional emergence. By federating, you create some function that was not available before, and this is the case of latency improvements for federated satellite systems. So if you just put in this intersatellite lens in orbit, and we have a specific side paper on this, and you just shuffle the data properly, you can always be done linking the most recent data uh, to the ground station. So you have a saving, really, that was not possible before at all. So this is one option. The other option is just resource allocation. So basically giving some of your capability to somebody else who gives it more value. And this is how you generate value. This is basically a shared amortization of an investment or a shared access to infrastructure which is happening for the cars or for sharing bandwidth 
in a satellite federation. In economy, they call it subadditive synergy, and it's more related to what we call weak synergy in this thesis. I was uh, including also very briefly a hint of a startup proto theory for, uh, for uh, just connecting all the themes of the thesis. So, the drivers we have seen that drive the achievable benefits, the interface cost, the physical limits to performance, the network topology, all these will either make the federation emerge or fail. And the way to mitigate the problems of initial negative synergy is to generate these mechanisms for return to the pioneer universe, if they're capable to uh, see the benefits in the local trade space. Maybe you can also create a federation of systems inside an organization, like a space agency, like a big company making ride sharing, and then open it. And then there's also potential favorite modes. You can have this tragedy of the commons, or you can have congestion, in cases that maybe you have too many uh, requests for a bandwidth in the network, and basically the system collapses partially. So all this has to be addressed to proper governance systems and mechanism, especially coordination is very important like having the schedule of all the contacts on, on a federation, having a, the Uber app that tells you where the taxes are, all these coordination mechanisms are a way to avoid these failure modes. I'll uh, just summarize very briefly the contribution. So most importantly, defining federations of systems and putting them in the system of systems map and consolidating them in the literature. This was a very important aim of this thesis. We show the economics of federations of systems as alternative to other communication architectures like geostationary and relays. We made use of this concept of synergy, which is quite novel in engineering systems. We developed a quantitative framework in, uh, in a field that sadly lacks a quantitative framework, especially virtual system of systems have not much uh, framework. And this is because there's no global authority, so there is no very commissioning research. <laughs> Right, this is really the connection there. And then, as a side, uh, as a side push, illustrating an alternative to deal with a large design combinatorial just by if you have a sequential deployment of systems, you can smartly navigate it to avoid computing too many uh, configurations. Okay, so I just want to uh, thank my team, who some of them are here, so thank you for all these years of uh, fruitful discussions, and also, of course, my advisor for his support since the very start of this adventure. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. We'll take the microphone now. We'll need two microphones, I think, because we'll have the jury and the candidate. I can shout also. Well, but then I think the video will be... Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, we'll, we'll go now into a series of questions by the member of jury. Uh, and we will start from my right and go this way after, so only do the first one. Okay, uh, very interesting. Um, thank you, Ignacy, for your presentation. Um, let's, let's go back to basics. Uh, can you go back to your synergy equation? Because I think this is a contribution you're playing. Right? A formal mathematical definition of synergy. You just uh, slowly uh, go through this equation, explain to yes. us each, uh, the, the bottom one, just explain each term in this equation, uh, where it's coming from, uh, why is it there? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, mm -hmm. first, let's, let's even go back to the so previous we'll synergy. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I need to look. I don't know if this works. So, first of all, let's check the first here, the, this end-to-end -end synergy. So, in here you have a set of end systems and you want to evaluate uh, what's their accumulated benefit of uh, collaborating, so that you just add their net benefits of cooperation. Little insight here, sometimes you do this through, uh, through optimizing, so through finding what's the best resource allocation. So sometimes some, some systems are having a negative uh, net benefit and some systems are having a positive net benefit and the overall sum is larger than zero. So, and this is what you want to see because they cannot, you can offset these local pluses or minuses with incentives. So this is how you assess a specific configuration. But then the question is, uh, 
systems don't live in a snapshot and the federation will evolve. Right? I'm sorry, but just the equation. Yeah. Just explain it to us. Yeah. So, <laughs> what you have here is this same thing, the synergy of each state, and basically you have m federation states, and at each state, you just uh, dividing this overall synergy by the number of systems, which is estimation of the MDC of that system, you basically <laughs> having the duration of all these different states and dividing it by the lifetime, so just to wait if some states are longer than others. And then you apply a discount factor. So, for instance, if every year you discount 20%, so you will when k is 1, you will multiply by 0, 0.8. When k is 2, you will multiply by 0, 0.8 by 0, 0.8. And like this. So basically, you're going to have a result of synergy from the perspective of the first system through life cycle. And it's, it's non-dimensional, right? It's a non-dimensional utility. Or it does has, it have units? It has it, units. It has it, units of... Uh, is it in monetary units? Yes, it's in dollars. Yes. Okay. Because this is this is in dollars. So this is in dollars. Uh, this D term is in what units? This might be years, years. This is number of system, and this is a ratio coefficient. So okay, it has the same units as the yeah. Okay, great. Um, my second question is: if you can go back to slide sixteen, which was uh, this this uh, total synergy, or this is the aggregate synergy in the federation by a number of systems inside. So my, my question is about coalition building inside the Federation. Um, remember we played the Oracle Federate game yeah. some almost a couple of years ago, and we had, I think, five or six players there. And then what happened is uh, some players started to, not everybody was equal in the Federation. Some players started to build sub-coalitions within the Federation in order to boost their their differential gains right, against the other players in the federation. Um, I don't think you modeled this in your thesis, this coalition building. So maybe that's future work. Can you explain? Yes. Um, did you observe this in your studies? Um, how could you model coalition building? OK, so I'll make two steps answer. Actually, I think it's more comfortable. I have to think. So yeah, the, the state answer is, is not in scope for now. But I'll show what uh, what can be done and what actually other colleagues have been doing on that and how does it connect. So in here, what you're having is a case on which maybe the first four, I think that's what you're hinting, the first four might make a coalition and kind of do not accept or do not trade with the fifth system. And I think what would drive this coalition and these decisions is the actual incentivization within the system. So in here, you're seeing actually the average. So the aggregate divided by the number of systems present. Right? But this says nothing about the particular gains for each participant. So it could happen that the fifth just decides to incentivize all the others so the others don't see a local reduction of, of the benefit. Right? So that actually he's kind of allowed to join or he negotiates to join because he or she knows that there might be other potential um, coalition candidates. And with this, actually, we can show some some slide with the orbital geometry, but what's happening here is that actually five has much better network access to six, seven, eight than the other four guys. So naturally, just because of the geometry, what's happening is these four guys are cooperating amongst themselves, and these other eight are mostly cooperating among themselves. So you have some kind of two isolated federations. If you would go deeper into this, there's let me go to the backup. Well, here you have seen, on a snapshot it's not easy to see, but you have the first three, four satellites which see themselves at the pole all the time. And satellite five is kind of off phase, but when satellite five will reach the pole, it will see four and six. So this is what's happening here. And in terms of future work, or other people working on this, Yeah, so this uh, sometimes we call about the tactical aspects of federating. So in here in my work, I'm saying, okay, what's the conditions for this to happen? But I'm not going on how would they operate day to day and how would some people negotiate with others or not. And when you are 
trying to assess that, I'd suggest more going into game theory type of approaches instead of a sequential MVP, just uh, use game theory because then everything is happening concurrently. So that's the type of approach you want to, to make for this for this coalition game. Thank you, Ignacy, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, a lot of uh, your theory and your method uh, depends on having realistic cost estimates uh, for making comparisons, etc. My question is, and maybe we can use uh, chart 14 as uh, an example, uh, how have you derived the cost that you've used in your uh, thesis all throughout. Uh, and I add an additional question to it. Uh, in very early phases, we very often are faced with doing comparative costs rather than absolute costs. Yes. So there's two questions. How did you derive your costs for your models? And second, how does the standard technique of comparative uh, uh, costing come into your theory and apply to your thesis? Absolutely, yeah, thanks for this question. So, as for the cost models, I, the general command is, of course, in all cases, it's different. In case of uh, the easiest to explain is wireless community networks, which just uses the commercial prices for different internet connections. So, uh, that's quite straightforward. In case of uh, the Uber case, we're using all the market data on the, uh, the taxi. Uh, I think all the tables are on the corresponding chapter, right, on how much does the, uh, compare to taxi, how much do you pay per mile per taxi in the New York, and how does this compare to pricing. So this is a whole series of tables in the uh, in chapter seven. And I think probably the most interesting is in the case of federations for satellites. So we're using usually available data for what is geostationary relays. So t has a public pricing per minute in these different uh, modes, which is like single axis and multiple axis. Every year changes a bit. Oh, the microphone. Okay, so, and this is based on actual real pricings. Now, for the business of ground stations, in here I'm actually detailing each of the ground station architecture, what does it mean in, in cost? So for the leases, we're also using available data from spaceflight networks, but also for the near-death NASA uh, network. For the ground stations, it's a bit more tricky, because people don't publish so much how much a ground station has costed them. So for the ground stations, let me find it. So we have basically a smart, very preliminary model for ground stations, which is a model, it's not based on real data, and it's basically deriving the cost of the ground station based on software cost with a series of classical and typical assumptions. So this is how the costs are derived. As per the comparative cost model, this is a very good question. So basically, all the architectural decisions and all the cost assumptions that we are using here, we are not modeling anything that would be equal for all the systems. So the operations cost of these ground stations, it would be equal for all them that have a ground station. So we don't need to model that. So basically, that's that's very, very uh, pertinent question. So basically, everything that would be the same for all the systems, so uh, any uh, all the development cost that is not communications or anything like that, we, are, we don't need to consider. So we kind of try not to make more assumptions than necessary, just what is necessary to have different costs and to have the deltas. Absolutely. Thank you. And I can return the <laughs> uh, You state in your presentation and more so in your thesis paper, uh, very uh, various different places that uh, the whole theory of federated systems is new. Have you looked at the literature of existing federating systems, uh, for example, the Sarnoop, about which not an awful lot is known, but this is one of the uh, systems with an intersatellite link, for example. Uh, in a certain way, our meteorological satellites are cooperating, and some of the new developments are OneWeb uh, or uh, 
Planet Lab, uh, which are producing constellations as we speak uh, for the for a new market. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you imagine that uh, they have used uh, uh, similar theories as background, and uh, have you looked at them at any way to relevant to put your own statement of FSS is totally new, and what you're producing here as a framework is uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, contributing to something totally new. So what I'm questioning is, uh, is your uh, theory really totally new? And if yes, in which way? Compared to the existing real situation in the, in the, in the space situation. So let's thank you for this. Yeah, so I think we need to make a differentiation in between the technology and, and the concept of federation. So the fact that there is uh, intersatellite in technology and there's missions that actually exchange data is absolutely no, no in question. This has been happening for a number of years. We have here just a selection of systems that use ISL, but there's many, many more systems that use ISL. And I would say the main difference here is that these systems are using intersatellite link and they're cooperating by design. So usually there's a single stakeholder that makes the server of the constellation or a single stakeholder that makes the planet labs or some people mention it in constellation, right? And this stakeholder plans everything already including all these exchanges and schedules and all the intersatellite link contents. I think the difference here, and we're taking from these all the technologies, like how much data rate could we exchange uh, in a reasonable manner, what types of uh, technology. We have actually an additional paper on the network aspects which I can show. So fundamentally, all this, we are importing all this technology, but the main difference on, on the approach here is the voluntary and ad hoc basis. So you're designing your system and you don't know if the other satellite owner or the other stakeholder will actually cooperate with you, right? You're just making your calculations and the economic grounds to see if it's going to be favorable, if it's going to happen. So, it's, I think the main issue is at the stakeholder and the authority level and the design, the way the design is organized, right? And another puntualization on this in terms of uh, federations and federalism. So, of course, there is, a, there is plenty to talk about. So, well, in terms of distributed space systems, I also want to mention there's many types of distributed space systems and the fact that missions have been working with each other, it has happened for a while, but again, this element of voluntarily and opportunistic uh, context is what is new in here. And the term federalism, I think we just saw the slide. So, it's in engineering, I want to credit Sage and Cooper in 2001, uh, they are people in Asian system of systems and they mention this term of federations in engineering management and they take it from corporate federation theories and I mean I will not go into this, this is really really out of my uh, experience to talk about political federalism but obviously all these principles have existed for a while and people already started to include it in, in federation but this is the first time we address this quantitatively, this potential voluntary cooperation, and we try to assess if it would be beneficial quantitatively. Okay, maybe. Okay, I understand your, your approach, and I also understand that uh, FSS uh, are very complicated, uh, very complicated uh, uh, systems. But uh, one last question from my side. Um, in your uh, thesis itself, you state that um, you can use this framework uh, in uh, uh, two uh, phases, namely the exploratory research, which I have no problem with at all, and the other one is in the concept uh, definition, uh, uh, including the refined stakeholder needs, the feasibility, identification, and, uh, and so forth. Can you explain that a little bit more? 
Yeah. What led you to uh, a statement that uh, both in the uh, exploratory research and in the conceptual uh, assessment of phases you can use your theory? Okay. Yeah, so actually that one is going to be quite straightforward to answer. So the answer is actually I described it in terms of claims. So this is what we were mentioning, right? This, this table with the different life cycle stages and what does this research applied to what's the scope. So at the time we wrote this, some of the case studies were underdeveloped, right? So we were, oh, I was, in, maybe we can go into a bit more close to preliminary design. But then of course, this is an architecting thesis, it's not a design thesis. And the types of models we are able to run in feasible computational time would not justify uh, that we're doing preliminary design. So I agree on, on this on this one. And I think it is not a, it doesn't hinder the thesis to just scope it in terms of we know we're not doing preliminary design. Yeah. So your thesis will be adapted to this effect? I think it's already adapted okay. to this effect, yeah. Okay, and fair enough. I just think this, this chapter needed to reflect the actual models that we end up using and that I uh, implemented. And I think it's perfectly fine for systems architecting thesis to work on the first uh, part of the life cycle. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, I, my question is about the relevance in the present and the future of, of, of the system. Of system and satellite. So, to, what do you know about the current state of, of published plans or of existing systems? And what is your prediction about it like 10 years from now? And will the systems of systems or federated systems influence uh, the, the, the orbits? What, where is the biggest market segment? Where, where will it influence satellite size? Where is the biggest influence? Uh, and also the, the market uh, for application. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for this question. So, in here, I'll answer on capital lines first. Uh, there is this project which we've been working, which actually have some posters around, which is called Operational Network of Individual Observation Noises, this uh, European Commission H2020 project, which is actually with industrial partners exactly looking into that. And uh, how big will these inter-satellites be? What satellites will be able to keep this? So, in terms of technology, uh, you see the other cases are happening. The case of satellites, I think, is still lacking a bit in terms of uh, network the radio technology is there, but if you want to handle the network dynamically in an ad hoc way, like mobile ad hoc networks, there's still a bit to do, and I think there's industrial efforts in this. Uh, there's also, I think, Cisco has a space router also, so there is many work on technology in this area, and as uh, Professor Stowers said, there is inside agency portfolios of missions which already perform some kind of uh, relays for other, for other partner missions, there's the Tandem Terra Cell who also do that, they do also cooperative uh, radar mapping. So uh, I think the space industry will see more of, and more of these things as the technology matures. Uh, about the market and the orbits, we can, this is a 2014 paper, I think it was one of our first papers in these technology issues, and what this paper was just looking is, we have several Earth observation spacecraft like RadarSat, GOI, Source, Swift, Pleiades, where would you put some relays, some other federated systems, so you could ensure maximum coverage? So uh, the market we envision more clearly is lower Earth orbital observation because of the amount of data existing there. And then you would put your relays on, on polar orbits, and you would go for polar satellites, and you would actually try to track, and we have an algorithm just to improve the coverage, you would be trying to have maximum access to satellites that have the highest instrument data rates. This can be very large satellites or not, but satellites that have very large instrument data is that's the ones who are gonna, as customers, need to be able to incentivize, right? That's what we will be doing to pay for the system. And I mentioned a couple of times, we also have some work, which I think I presented in 15, about a protocol inspired in terrestrial and mobile adult networks to be able to handle these exchanges in a dynamic manner without having to pre-schedule in advance, with having all the network discovery happening within the satellites in orbit. 
and it is challenging, of course, for satellites to the dynamics of the system and the ranges involved. But you have this improvement of latency by just shuffling packets cleverly around it, creates this functional emergence. So you can uh, test the protocol and you can find, you can demonstrate it. Uh, you, uh, here we're not, we just demonstrating the protocol, there might be others, we're not claiming this is the optimal way to handle the network, but there is ways to handle very dynamic networks that could end up with improvements in latency. Okay, that's better. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question about timing. Uh, we see from uh, we saw from your example, especially from one uh, with the cars, that the timing can be very important. Or it, it is not just about uh, what is potential benefit, but how soon we can uh, we, we can we can claim it back, especially as investors and decision makers in companies being interested in, in uh, getting something from federation. So. Uh, have you thought about uh, how how time as a uh, as a demand dimension could be included in, in a, maybe assessment? Uh, because obviously there is a difference if you're a fifth satellite or six satellite, but if you come together, it it uh, brings almost immediate value for all other members of federation. So uh, sure. and is it, should we look at a uh, timing problem as a kind of part of uh, relative to life cycle or in any other way? So I think that there is basically an interplay with the life cycle of the system and the discount rate you're using for that. So if the returns of the federation will happen after your system has ended up its operational life cycle, of course you're not going to opt for it. That would be a problem. You have very large, uh, we have, you have very large discount rate and I think we have actually these sensitivity plots. So, you have very high discount rate. This is something I mentioned, but I didn't show the plot. But you have something crazy like 50, 60, 70%. Every year, the return of investment you discount it by 90%. Of course, it's not going to make sense. So, you have to be working on a bit more mid or long term. Also, in terms of uh, the problem for right sourcing, is you need an initial investment of 290 million. And you need time. I have a bus diffusion model for this. You need time for the users to even be aware of the system. So the answer would be yes. And there's an interplay in between the life cycle cost and the uh, discount rate used to understand if this would happen or not. About launching uh, together, I think this is something uh, in the conclusions I mentioned. I think it's a way of, it's a part of my recommendations for implementation, seeing this, as you said very well. If you launch the first two systems together and they can cooperate and there's a benefit, if you can do it, do it. And it's about the leverage every participant has. So, in case of satellite systems, you see very clearly how the way to do this is within the portfolio of an agency, which can launch these two, three systems that are already having an entity, and then open, use interoperability standards, uh, and be able to open this to third, fourth party. And this is the way this initial value of that will be able overcome it. In here we work in more of a kind of worst case scenario when the first system is actually suffering uh, uh, cost expenses and before there's a recovery. It's kind of a worst case, but if you could, yes, if you could time it and have two, three satellites at a time, uh, probably we wouldn't even, <laughs> even need to run the framework because we could see the, the benefits already and there would be no need to see how they are recovered later in the trade space. Thank you. Uh, building on one of previous questions about coalitions, is there, uh, ha ha have you thought about or, or maybe even tried, uh, is there any kind of optimal size of federation? Because in, in federations like uh, Uber, that you put as an example, where there's uh, hundreds of, of, of parties, is there benefit of having maybe two smaller federations which may be operating uh, on a more profit profitable way, more synergetic way? So the, the results don't show that. So if we go to any type of 
plot that uh, we have with synergy as, as the federation evolves. So I'm always showing here. Yeah, I'm always showing the average, right? But actually the absolute synergy is much larger because we have to multiply here by two, here by three, here by four. So, you know, if I would give you the absolute synergy, the, the market size, it's actually uh, quite escalating pretty quickly. So I, I would tend to say no, because even for the fifth satellite, uh, the fact that there's previous satellites makes him in a state that is not negative, right? If he would be alone, not cooperating at all with the previous, he would start being in negative, and you see, and he can make some some trade. So I think you need to keep the size of the market as, as big as possible, so you ensure more visibility options in terms of Uber. You ensure that there's going to be a taxi even in the worst of times, or there's going to be a rider. So I think fractioning it is just actually losing some some of its uh, power. Uh, but recently we, we witnessed that uh, in Moscow or in Russia we have uh, Yandex and Uber coming together. Uh, is that thinking about is it better for them then to keep kind of separate channels or to put them as a one in a kind of platform way to coordinate all transportation? So I think this touches more like branding and, and, and marketing and market leverage issues, right? So I think it's, it's, it's another type of, of topic. But um, I would say in terms of sheer market power, and I think this connects to, to synergy in terms of economy and economy, when they do mergers between companies, that's why they use the term synergy to assess the returns of this uh, shared amortization for investments, uh, larger economies of scale. So this is synergy in economy, and I think merger of price-sharing platforms is, is some kind of synergy in economy, and I think they need, they're looking for more market leverage. Then there's another detail, if they want to keep their brand separated or not, I think it's more of a specific market uh, situation. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions for you. Coming back to the units of the synergy, did you only look at cost, or could you have for, to calculate the net benefit of collaboration or cooperation other units also, or a combination of units, but I'm thinking about latency as, as a big advantage, because if I have a rider, you can cut my waiting time by 10 minutes every time. This is a benefit of cooperation, but how do you quantify this, and did you look at this? Yes, so I think, uh, it's a very good question, so we can connect to something that maybe it's important to mention. So. In these cases, we're facing a very common pitfall, a very common issue of system of system, which is aggregating utilities or benefits for different systems. So this has been solved in the literature, usually with multi-attribute utility theory, just aggregating the utilities. If you have a single global authority stakeholder, you can aggregate these utilities, right? And I'll go to your question in a second. I just need to introduce it. So if you have the global stakeholder, you can have some kind of aggregate utilities across systems which are not really similar, and you can justify. If you have no global stakeholder and a voluntary cooperation, you cannot justify some weighted sum of utilities and say the benefit for the systems is utility of system one plus increase in utility of system two, right? So I needed to map it to something that was consistently having the same value across all the different uh, systems. So that's why monetary units and this used, in here I'm using the Pareto form as a mapping function from utility to cost, which is kind of cost-based cost pricing instead of value-based pricing, it would be like doing something like that, to avoid this pitfall. Because when you say, okay, what's the, uh, what's the benefit of this federation? If I start adding utilities of systems which are heterogeneous and have different stakeholders, we will never agree, right? Which way to put to each stakeholder? So, the thing is, monetary units mean the same, or mostly the same, to all the stakeholders, but it doesn't mean that I'm not only using monetary units, I'm using benefit also, but I'm mapping the benefit. So, in CA cooperation, you have the actual cost, but then this Pareto function F is mapping an utility change to a cost. So, I, I, what I'm doing is, for satellites, when the economic returns of 
the economic benefits are usually diffused in earth observation and it's difficult to map them directly and mapping them to the actual Pareto from to, to derive the actual cost difference for the user. Importantly, in red sourcing, I didn't need to do that. I could do a direct economic return. Because if you use, you don't need the Pareto from the user. If you use Uber instead of a taxi and per mile you save half a dollar, this is the benefit, and right? And directly you have the MVC of the, of the user. You don't need to do this previous process with the trade space. So this was a way, especially for systems which has diffuse economic returns, to be able to capture it in a unit that was consistent across all of them. Yeah. But then don't you think that, you know, like you're saying, for any satellite system or distributed uh, taxi rider, they are more than cost advantage. And maybe the, the, I can maybe be ready to pay more, like, you know, there's some taxi company, they say, well, pay more and your latency will be smaller. Exactly, yes. But can, can the concept of synergy that you define account for this type of... Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So, let's find an example with the taxi now. So, we have it somewhere here. We have the wait time. No, we don't have the wait time, but you'll see it's one of the parameters I'm tracking is the waiting time. So, the question is, what benefits of cooperation are there to be captured? So, in case of satellites, I was using latency and bandwidth, and through a surface Pareto from, I was mapping it to a cost coordinate. Uh, and this is how any benefit, you actually map it to a cost coordinate, if you can represent it through the Pareto from. In case of taxis, the only other thing uh, besides cost that was used was the um, actually waiting time. So if you assume that taxis and Uber are, have cross-market elasticity of one, so it's basically a similar service in terms of comfort and experience, what's the other thing besides how much you pay that might drive or influence you? Your decision is the waiting time. If you have to wait 30 minutes or not. But the waiting time you can also connected to economic benefits through, it's connected, in, this is through the um, average wage, so I think it's like seven dollars uh, per hour or something in the States. So how's that, that's how you map it to monetary units. Thank you very much, but maybe one last question yep. is, uh, right sourcing, there's definitely, to me it appears, there's a very strong coordination mechanism up front what you model is the right peer-to-peer -peer system, right? Is it not? Why is your model still applicable in that case? You see, what well, it's obviously the people, like you said, they invested a lot of money up front to put the system together. Yeah, and, and we model that. We do model that. So we go to the decisions we're taking here. So sorry, there's a lot of backup slides. So. Who was taking the decisions here in the red sourcing case was not the drivers and the riders. So the drivers and the riders were joining or not the system based on market supply and demand. And based on how much benefit they perceive, the more benefit they perceive, the more they will join the system. It's like classic uh, market elasticity economics. Who is making the decisions is the coordination platform. And I totally agree that in this case, the coordination platform plays a pivotal role. So what you're doing here, is you're controlling the pricing through this platform or how much you're going to allocate to the driver and the user. And absolutely, the, the authority of the um, platform is essential because uh, there's 290 accumulated, million accumulated losses in the New York market before you make any benefit. And we can show additional plots on this case, which are here. Yeah. So, if you see, so first they are actually incurring losses because they are basically subsidizing drivers and this is absolutely what's happening in real life. Before, there's enough critical mass of drivers and users that the waiting times are reduced and then you can adjust the price. You don't have to incentivize so much for this to happen. But absolutely what I was commenting is that you also need a platform because of this, because the leverage of every individual peer here is very little. The leverage of every driver or every user to foster the federation is not like one satellite out of ten. 
to a user up of 20,000. So you need the platform to execute this coordination and to harmonically develop the, the federation. Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of the main differences between the two cases. So if I understand correctly, the, uh, your analysis and the, the synergy and what you develop is applicable to all kinds of systems of systems, not only on federated systems. Yeah. Yeah, and now I will reinvent the wheel, and I will actually mention in economy, synergy is called the social welfare, and <laughs> absolutely is part of conventional economy theory, so uh, absolutely you can measure everything. Uh, in economy they call it uh, social welfare, and consumer surplus, and user surplus, and uh, this is something that absolutely exists, yes, and can assess many things. Thank you very much. I'll come back and be quite careful. Oh, you have another? Yes. I need to ask you one question because it bugs me a little bit. Uh, you're stating in your introduction, uh, while you explain what you understand from architecting, that traditional systems engineering is concerned with interfaces within the systems, whereas architecting is uh, the way you've defined it, uh, is dealing with. Uh, external interfaces which I suppose you need interdependencies. Can you explain how you've come to the to the traditional systems engineering uh, definition which you've used here? Yeah, so systems systems engineering uh, will be deals with interfaces mostly and what is meant there is not that only internal interfaces of course but what is meant there and maybe it's not completely well expressed is that Traditional research work, a lot of research work in systems architecture is concerned with interfaces and leverage of interfaces within systems and not so much between different systems when you are architecting both. So usually you're designing your system and of course you're taking into account external influences. It's, it's actually crucial, right? So you are taking into account external interfaces, but usually you're not taking into account one architecting of a system, the architecting of another one in the same framework and these external interfaces. Usually just uh, taken for granted as a snapshot or as a as something that can evolve and actually so other ways to do this you can use uh, time expanded decision networks, we can use epoch here analysis to actually change the exogenous factors on the system. So this is actually something that you could also incorporate on the on the thesis. So maybe it's not Properly phrased there, but I just want to say that let's say the emphasis of this thesis is more on the uh, uh, interfaces between. Yeah. Can I ask another very short question? Uh, using latency as one of your uh, uh, important criteria in Earth observation satellites is in fact one of the things that leads you towards the synergy equations, etc., etc. Can you imagine uh, certain Earth observation applications where latency is not important? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there are some applications like, like weather, like uh, fire detection, which latency is very important. And we've been working in this European Commission project, which is about reducing latency mostly and using federations for that. And that's one of the key value proposals of federations to reduce latency. That's why it was fundamental to really Obviously, there's many, many, many Earth observation systems for which latency is not crucial. One week or even several weeks when you're doing radar altimetry or when you're just doing uh, Landsat 250 meter resolution mapping, right? GLC, you don't need that. But in here, actually, we're talking of federations of five, ten satellites. And Earth observation is hundreds. So, of course, we, we're not including all the picture of, of Earth observation. That's Fair enough. We'll, uh... Thank you so much. Um, I, I had a, a question, and I think you mentioned that one of the nice things of your approach is that we don't need to know the incentive scheme. Okay? Yeah. We just use the results, we don't need to know what's behind it. My question goes back to the coalition, uh, coalition building. Is it at that point in time that you should know how the incentive scheme really works on the inside? Yeah. Absolutely, when, uh, if you are focused on tactical aspects of the game, and sometimes 
when we separate this thesis from other works of the research group, and there's a, a research group work. We have been working actually on both aspects, and this thesis I refer it to the strategic aspect. Let's say to the necessary technical and economical conditions for federation. There's, there's all sorts of tactical aspects uh, on how you do the exchanges, how you do the bids, how do you compete for resources within the federation, do you align with other federates, do you compete with other federates, and uh, I'll just uh, repeat again, I think this is a, something for game theory. And here, actually, I would refer you to the Pick and Volcan also Matibosian paper, so uh, one of the reasons this is not more developed is because there would be another PhD thesis, which probably you're uh, invited in a couple of years about the practical aspects of the Federation and once it's working, because the other, the other thesis is more like once it's working, how it happens, and then uh, this other PhD was asking, so how will it happen, how many satellites, and, and I had to answer that, right? And now the other thesis is how, how do you operate day to day, how do you do the bids and the competition, and uh, I, I agree that that's also completely fundamental, but I agree that first, I think first the systems need to see the value to life cycle and from a strategic perspective, right? Just one, one last question. Um, in your thesis, you mentioned um, the, the tree generation, the tree building, which becomes very, very big, and you mentioned it's like 561 days, and I, that's still a simple example. The question is now, of course, how are you handling this in real examples? You mentioned a bit in your thesis, you did not touch on it in the presentation. Could you yeah. re explain it a little bit? Exploration of the tree. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, sure. Let's fetch some, some slides that will shed some light into this. So, here it is. Yeah. So, it takes some part of the, of the thesis material. Uh, to explore this, which is just an implementation issue, but it's very important implementation issue. So, we have a very, very large uh, tree. You're actually creating a bound of n by a to the n, when a is the number of decisions and elevated to the number of systems that you're deploying, and the, which is the tree levels. So, you have a very, very, very large tree, from which most options are actually uh, not appealing at all. So. Um, there is two, fundamentally, two types of exploration I have attempted. First, a type of greedy policy, which is just pick the next uh, successor state with highest synergy. Um, some little remarks. First, you, you cannot do it on the first stage, because the first stage usually has negative synergy, so you have to take all the initial states. And then from this, from each of them, you offspring, and you evaluate synergy, and you take the two best, and then the two best. So this is, instead of a to the n is expanding 2 to the n, right? So you, you have an improvement there. Um, sometimes it can happen, oh, that was a vision, I wanted to show cases where maybe, and actually it didn't happen much, but you go through many quite negative synergy states, but you reach a much better state after, and this is hidden on the tree. So that's why I tried greedy 3, which is picking 3 successors, and greedy 4. Um, and actually, they give quite results, and I will compare with the global optimum. And then the question was, okay, can we really see what's the global optimum of, of synergy, what's the best federation embodiment? Uh, in some cases, it was possible to keep it, and I will compare it right now to the grid approach. So, to compute the full tree, it was fundamental to prune something. So, uh, using usually alpha, beta pruning, uh, uh, quite standard techniques. So, what I'm doing is, I can bound very importantly, I can bound the synergy because I know the range of the trade space. So I know at most if for free they get the performances of a 300 million communication system, that's the synergy they're going to have. So I can compare the best possible outcome of a branch to the actual outcome of another and start a pruning. And with this pruning mechanism, which I have uh, set up, a pruning mechanism which are detailed in the thesis, so you can compare. Uh, best outcomes to worst outcomes, and if a worst outcome of a tree is better than a best outcome of a tree, you can prune the latter. Once you clear fully a tree, you can go back to an antecessor node and clear again if this actual value is better than the best outcome than the other. 
And how does this uh, look so like this? This is a case in which uh, you use greedy 2, greedy 3, greedy 4, and it's one of these, uh, in one of these plots, it's one of the points of this plot with 10 million USD interface and 40 million cost constraint, this has been shown. So what happens here is that in the full tree, you're evaluating 810,000 states for five satellites, and you can kill 28% of the cases, which means I needed several days of a, of a cluster, uh, but it was doable. And you see, it just improves a little bit from greedy, and greedy 4 shows the same result, of splitting just the four best cases shows the best result. And uh, this was done for a number of cases, concluding that if you use greedy 4, you can actually approach very much the, it's quite a well-behaved problem, frankly. So you can approach very well the global optimum. And another thing I want to just a final remark is, um, and it's not a big deal if you didn't find the global optimum, because then it means you're being conservative towards federation. You're just not finding the best embodiment, but you're finding some good embodiment, so it's a conservative approach. And you see, greedy saves me a lot of computation hours, a lot, a lot. So that's what was done for most of the cases here. Thank you very much. Alessandro? Yeah, but there one final comment. Okay, so mine is a comment. Mine is not very bad. So, uh, not the question. <laughs> so, uh, I just wanted to actually, I think that's the answer to the first question that Professor Scott asked, and uh, clarify what, what's the federation using something that in Nassi did, which you didn't show yet. Am I allowed? Of course. Okay. So, this is, uh, should appear in the case. Ah, you have it on the side. Yeah, so, okay, so look at the screen on this side. This was a Horizon 2020 project we worked with, uh, sorry, Thales Alain Space, uh, which is our first competitor, uh, on uh, basically characterizing all this uh, uh, you know, satellite distributed satellite concept and so on, how you can use the for <coughs> And we did produce a report, it's public, the reason why I showed the website, you can download it, and we clarified specifically what does constellation mean? How does it, you know, how is it different from a train, from a cluster, from a swarm, from a federation? Okay. Uh, so uh, in there we identified four um, categorizations. So the uh, let's say are the mission world's share, uh, are the satellites cooperating, uh, are the satellites the same or are they different, and are they autonomous or not? Okay. Uh, then in a, in a later paper also authored by Tassi. Uh, we went a little bit further and we added uh, over, well, we said homogeneity size, uh, so how many, so the, the other one was how many, uh, special separation, you know, and the flight goes and the flight flat, uh, function interdependence and relation to the independence. Now, long story short, just to uh, explain specifically what's the difference between the constellation like Sabu, okay, like satellites, etc. And uh, an ideal federation is actually, as you can see uh, here, so constellation is doing the same mission. So Sadhu is imaging the Earth, uh, X band, uh, so on and so forth, uh, right? It's, it's a kind of a uniform mission. Uh, in a federation, each satellite can do whatever they want, okay? On a, on a, on a principle, okay? Uh, in terms of cooperation, uh, in a constellation, if you are by yourself, you need to cooperate and make the excel work. Uh, all the time. Uh, in a federation, it's optional. So it's opportunistic, and when it, happens, it happens when uh, the conditions that we can see identified are truly important. Right? Uh, then the satellites can be completely different. So if it, in a federation, you can have uh, yeah. uh, telephone satellites and other satellites. Uh, yeah, and I, I won't spend more time just to say actually there's many more concepts you can find. If you do this, uh, what we call uh, morphological analysis, uh, and frankly, you know, just to say is uh, uh, homogeneity high or low, it's higher or lower, huh? uh, is size higher or lower, uh, you can find about we found 32 possible concepts of distributed satellites. So, uh, of course, the effects are plastic, they're fractured. And I just wanted to say, actually, Ignacio was one of the main authors in both of these things. I'm surprised you didn't show that. <laughs>
I have the slides, so I do <laughs> in the middle of this. Thank you very much. Yeah, here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. So you had it there. Uh, now the jury will uh, leave the room. And we came with the room. So the jury took the time to discuss and uh, give comments and so on. And uh, we came to uh, the conclusion that it's a pass. So you have we recommend. <laughs> You made the, the term that was used, and I agree with it, the vivid defense of your thesis. You were dynamic, you were uh, really um, uh, very, um, you answered questions very well. And you, uh, we all agreed that you're, you displayed a, a very high level of uh, knowledge in this field. And even your supervisor said that in some aspects of federated system, you knew more than him. So that's a good sign. Usually that's to expect, all right? Um, so it's, uh, we, uh, in the earlier version of the thesis, we noticed some uh, consistency of terms, which uh, I think you've corrected by now in the, in the last, last version. And uh, so the thesis is certainly cutting edge. It has, uh, and uh, the contribution that uh, we found is that you formalized the synergy and a federated system with collaboration. We think that this is a high value and uh, people think that it's going to be, the jury thinks that it's going to be, uh, there are going to be other works coming from this and this is an excellent sign of the quality of your work. Of course, this is a very, very complex subject that uh, has a broad uh, uh, coverage and needs to be covered from multiple points of view. And this is again, a, a, a something that you bring, a quality that you bring, a contribution that you bring to the field. And this is because this is not easy to cover such a complex uh, subject. So in general, we, uh, we congratulate you for this uh, defense. And I really think for myself, this is the first one we had as Caltech. And I think that this is uh, the level that I've seen uh, in Canada and in France when I've been at PhD thesis defense. And so, you can be proud of, of yourself and uh, we congratulate you and Nancy for your work. Okay. You want to say a word? Well, I just, uh, I just want to thank everybody again who hopefully win, uh, also our guest from Superhero, my advisor from all, all these uh, years. I mean, when we came to, uh, I remember very well when we came to Russia, January 2014. Everything was not, Coco was not even built. We didn't even have a building for school. We were renting space somewhere else. So we came a long way as, a, as an institution and of course uh, as an individual. So I want to thank everyone who has been uh, supporting and contributing one way or another. Thanks. Thank you very much. So now.